Second Corinthians chapter three. I remember the day that I got married, sitting in the basement at Calvary Chapel Pocatello, thinking to myself, "What in the world am I doing?" What was I thinking? Now, it wasn't so much the marriage part. I would have been happy to be married without the wedding. Because upstairs were hundreds and hundreds of people that knew me. Everybody pretty much I knew was upstairs waiting for me to go up. And I just had this realization come over me that I'm going to have to go up there and stand in front of all those people. Now, there's a reason why they don't give a groom any jobs on the wedding day. At least you shouldn't. You should never give the groom a job on the wedding day. I mean, basically, he goes with the pastor wherever the pastor goes. The pastor takes him up to the front and says, stand right there. And he just stands there. And then everybody else does their parts. They're the ones that had to remember to walk and stand in a certain place and so fast and whatever, so slow. And then the the bride comes in. She has the biggest part, her father on her arm usually, and coming up the aisle. It was in the olden days, mostly, not so much today, that they would actually have a veil over their face and the father would lift the veil and kiss his daughter on the cheek, give her a hug, and, and then the groom, the, the pastor would say, okay, now go down there and get her. And, and the, then the groom would go down and get the bride and bring her up to the front. Now, it, it's this part in the wedding where I always, well, not always, but I have said to the bride, you know, especially in a big wedding, you know, if it's elaborate, I always, I always say, You know, this is the moment you've been waiting for, preparing for. You've probably been thinking about this day since you were five years old. The day that you would stand here with your dress just perfect and all these people here. You are a princess today. And then I look at the guy and I say, but you actually just thought about this. The reality of it hit you about five minutes ago. (laughs) When we both stood up here and and the guy's like, yeah, you know, I had no idea, you know. But but I remember standing there, and, and I don't even remember the line coming in. Everything was kind of in a fog, you know, one of those surreal experiences, otherworldly. And then, and then the heart music changed, and, and all of a sudden it was, here comes the bride. And I looked down, and there was Shannon. And it was like every, all the fear, all the anxiety went away immediately. Now, being an introvert, and you, maybe you don't, you think that's weird. Okay, you're up there talking every week and you're introverted. Yeah, super introverted. This, this is a miracle of God that I could even stand up in front of people. I mean, there's no way. Back in those days, it was just, um, I would have been shaken. I, I remember when I first, act, you know, this is not even in my sermon, but when I first, we had this big pulpit and I would grip it like this as I preached and my, uh, the hives would just go up my neck on my face. I mean, seriously, that's, that's me normally. But anyway, um, but when I saw her, everything changed. You see, before that, we had, we had a, a, an arrangement. We had a covenant, a, an engagement covenant that we were under, promised to each other. But you see, with the engagement covenant, there were rules to be kept. There were lines not to be crossed. There was established, this is the way that it is. And, 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 and I couldn't cross those lines. I couldn't break those rules. And yet, now that I was in this new marriage covenant, all of those rules went away, and I had access, I had intimacy, I had connection. Even even on that day, I could not see her in her full glory until she was able to come up the aisle when she was unveiled before me. And, And so too, as we look at our text today, we're going to be looking at the the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, in in many ways, is a good illustration of the engagement versus the wedding. You see, the one, the Old Covenant, had limited access, rules not to be broken, boundaries not to be crossed. And and if if you kept the rules, it didn't draw you any closer. But if you broke the rules, you definitely were pushed farther away. And yet, there would come a New Covenant one that would bind us to God, give us full access to His blessings, full access to His His wonder and His benefits, but more than anything, full access to Him. And and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So if you will stand with me, if you're able, just giving honor to God's Word, unless you're driving and (laughs) listening on Facebook or something, um, or in the radio. This is what our text says. 2 Corinthians chapter seven or first, Second Corinthians chapter three verse seven. But if the ministry of death, 
written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies in their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. You may be seated. Now last time we began this section, 2 Corinthians, where Paul began to defend his ministry. And, and remember he said, hey, we don't need letters from you or letters from others to you to commend ourselves, to, to say that we're legitimate. In, in fact, you being the Corinthian church are the very evidence, the fruit, the legitimacy of our, of our ministry. You know, the fact that you guys are following the Lord, the fact that the Lord is using you, the fact that you are an established church and, and, and a church that the Lord used us to plant, we don't need epistles, but, but you are an epistle. In fact, the Lord has written on your heart the things that, that would, would prove the power of the Spirit in your own lives. And that's kind of what Paul was, was talking about. You see, there was a problem. There were those who probably had come to Corinth, and we just kind of surmise that by what Paul is talking about here, that, that it was probably the same group of people, the same type of people who came to Corinth that had come to Antioch when Paul was first in his ministry there in Acts chapter 15. And if you remember that, Paul there in Antioch, it, it, they were together and, and everybody was, was you know, celebrating the, the, the freedom and the joy of the Lord. But then some brethren came up from James. James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, the Lord's brother. These men came from James, it says. They were Jerusalem Christians. And, and they, they told everybody there, hey, great that you guys have received Jesus the Messiah, Mashiach Nagi, the, the Messiah, but now you need to obey the law of Moses if you want to remain saved. If you want your salvation to be legitimate, we need to circumcise you. We need to, uh, uh, you know, basically you have to start following these dietary laws and these ritualistic laws and all the, all the laws that are prescribed within the law of Moses. Now even Peter, it tells us in Galatians chapter 2, that Peter was drawn away in hypocrisy, fearing these men coming from James. Peter the Apostle, can you imagine? He, he's fearing the men that came from James, and he withdrew himself. Earlier he'd eat with the Gentiles, but once they came, he separated himself, playing the hypocrite. And Paul, it tells us in Galatians chapter 2, had to rebuke him to the face, saying, you're to blame that you're letting this happen. Now, of course, that started the Jerusalem Council where they went down and they had this big meeting, and James was there and Peter was there, and they all came to the conclusion that, hey, we are saved, the Jews are saved the same way that they are by faith in Jesus and not by the keeping of the law. And Peter would even say, why would we put a yoke of bondage on them that neither we nor our fathers could bear? And, and so they, they gave them a few rules, a few rules to help them um, not to be offensive to the Jews. And he says, you know, don't eat blood, you know, things sacrificed to idols, you know, stay away from those types of things. And then, of course, to, to refrain from sexual immorality. And, and if you do those things, you do well. Now, it's interesting. As we see in our text today, it shows the difference between the old covenants, the law written on stone, versus the new covenant that Jesus has written on our hearts. And so let's back up to verse 5 just to get a running start at this, some context. It says in verse 5, Now that we, or excuse me, not that we are sufficient to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God who made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, 
but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And, and so Paul here, he's saying, hey, you know, it, it is God who wrote on our hearts. He's the one who made us, um, who, who wrote his law upon our hearts and on our minds. He's the one who's changed us from the inside out. And so our sufficiency doesn't come from accolades or certificates or, or degrees that we've earned, but it comes from the Spirit of God. You know, it's interesting because a, a lot of people, you know, they, they go to school to be a minister. As if it's a career path or something like that. And they get a degree, a seminary degree or a, or a Bible college degree to go out and, and to be a pastor somewhere. And, and that's okay if you're called. But if you're not called, if God has not called you and said, this is what I want you to do, then it's just a piece of paper. But if the Spirit has given you a calling and a direction and empowered you to do it, then, then you do it with or without the piece of paper, with, with or without the degree. And I'm not, I'm not against getting a degree or, or getting some education so that you might be a better pastor or something like that. I think that's necessary sometimes. But the reality is that it's really what God has done. And Paul is saying that when he says the sufficiency doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from our accolades. It, it comes from the Spirit of God. And He alone... Not he and my degree or he and my whatever, but he alone makes us sufficient for this. You know, and then he talks about the letter kill, speaking of, as he mentioned in verse 3, and also he'll mention here in verse 7, he's talking about the, the letter that, that was written in stone. The law kills, but the Spirit brings life. Verse 7, but if the ministry of death written and engraved in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. I don't know how many times over the years I've heard people ask, Christians ask the question, usually new Christians ask the question, do we need to keep the Ten Commandments? And then I've heard Christians answer, yes, we need to keep the Ten Commandments. And I've heard other Christians answer, no, we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. Now, not only is it the wrong question to ask, but both those answers are wrong. What, what those answers do is, is show, it betrays you that you really don't understand the gospel at all. Because it, it doesn't have to do with that. I, I, you know, I've heard people say these things, but this misunderstanding just begs me to say, so how have you done when it comes to the commandments? I mean, the commandments are beautiful. I mean, all 613 of them, but we have the 10. He's talking about the ones written in stone here, the 10 commandments. You know, in Jewish communities, there was, there was moral law, the 10 commandments. And then there was um, dietary laws, you know, health regulations. But then there was also civil laws to govern their community, their, their uh, group. And, and yet all of these laws stemmed from the 10 in, in a sense, the, the other 613 or the 603 actually were all part of those 10, kind of defining how that looks in your, in your life. But boiling it, boiling it down to the 10, Paul says they're beautiful, it's glorious, but rightly he calls it a ministry of what? Death. A ministry of death. That's interesting. And what does that mean? Well, think about the Ten Commandments. Worship only God. Don't make idols. Don't use the name of the Lord God in vain. Honor the Sabbath. Honor your parents. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. And don't desire what is your neighbor's, whether it's his spouse, his car, his stuff, his house. Don't don't desire. I think it says donkey, actually, in the original. But, you know, whatever you drive. (laughs) Now, now, don't we, okay, you, you hear that list, and, and which ones, if you were going to say, okay, I'm not going to keep the Ten Commandments, which ones would you throw out? I mean, don't we, don't we read that list and we're like, yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly how everybody should live. And, and even as you have children, you tell your kids, don't do these things. And many of those things that you tell them not to do are right here, right? Right here in the Ten Commandments. It's, it's how we expect everybody to live. And yet, let me ask you, how have you done? 
Which ones have you kept? All of them? Some of them? None of them? You see, that's the problem. We look at the, the Ten Commandments, have no other gods before me. Have you ever worshipped anything other than God? Like that girl or that guy? Or, or desired something so strongly that's all you could think about? Have you ever made an idol, an image of something and bowed down to worship it? Oh no, I've never done that. Well, what about your career? Even though you didn't fashion it into an idol or, or money or sex or drugs or anything that you, you, all you could think about was that thing. Honor or t- do not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. Well, it's possible that you've never taken God's name and reduced it to a nasty word in your vocabulary. But the word vain just means do not take the Lord thy God's name lightly. Have you ever uttered the name of God without full reverence? Thou shalt honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Have you always taken one day in seven, your entire life, one day in seven, and set it aside to focus, meditate on God and not do any work? Honor your parents. Now, I know the New Testament says, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. For this is the first commandment with a promise. Honor your mother and your father that your days may be long upon the earth, right? But honor is more than just obedience. You know, if I go and leaving my house and my mom says, be home at 10, and I say, my mom's such a drag. I've dishonored my parents. Just, just painting them in a bad light. If I don't always make them look good, I've dishonored them. Do not murder. Oh, finally one. Most of us can say, okay, I haven't done that wait a minute, didn't Jesus say if you've hated someone without cause, you've committed murder in your heart? Or if you're angry with someone without cause. Do not commit adultery. Again, Jesus said, if you look at someone with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. Do not steal. It doesn't matter the size of what you stole. If it was your boss's time when you were doing your own thing, playing that game on your phone, or whether it was that ballpoint pen that you took from the cashier, and you know you didn't mean to take it, but then when you realized you had it, you didn't take it back, or maybe just a little bit of change. They overpaid you for, or gave you too much change back when you bought that, and you didn't go back and take it back. You stole. Do not lie. Do not bear false witness. Have you ever said anything that wasn't true? God will not hold him guiltless who lies. And then it comes down to the clencher. Number 10 has nothing to do with an outward action, but everything to do with your heart. Do not desire something that does not belong to you. Paul, when he read this commandment, he said, I I thought I was doing okay. Outwardly, I'd bit my tongue. I hadn't spoken anything. I hadn't looked, I hadn't, I hadn't committed adultery or committed murder, murder physically, but then I realized in verse, in number 10, rather, that Covetousness was a sin of the heart. And in fact, all of these commandments are based in covetousness. That's where they begin. And he says, when I read, do not covet, he says, the sin, that sin revived and I died. In fact, throughout the whole Old Testament and New Testament, it says, the soul that sinneth shall surely die. The wages of sin is death. He who keeps the whole law yet offends in one point, is guilty of it all. And so I look at the law and I say, yes, that's how everybody should live. But then I find myself incapable, unwilling to keep it. And so the ministry of death is upon me. So why did God give the law? The law had a ministry of showing you who you really are that you are terrible, that you're awful. I mean, look at the person next to you and just tell them you're terrible. (laughs) Just in case they didn't catch that message. But the law is good. It's so glorious. I I mean, it seems helpful, doesn't it? It it seems if somebody tells you, here's the Ten Commandments, you're like, okay, yes, 
we, everybody should keep those. I mean, that's what everybody says when they read them. Everybody should do that. Seems like good news, even. Oh, this is what God wants me to do. Just ten things? You know, we rejoice until it's a problem. It's glorious until it comes in contact with your will. And so what's the purpose of the law? Galatians 4, or Galatians 2 tells us. I have Galatians 4 written there. Galatians 2, no, Galatians 3. I can't even get this right. Galatians 3, verse 24. See, there was a 2 and a 4 in there. It says, therefore the law was the tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. This is what Habakkuk was saying when he said, when he, you know, when he quotes God and God tells him that the just shall live by faith. It's not that the just shall live by the law or the just shall live by all their righteousness, but he says the just shall live by faith. And that's what the whole good news is about. So, the question about keeping or not keeping the law are really silly. The real question is, since I can't keep the law, what do I do? The purpose of the law was just simply to show me that I am not good. So Paul described this in, in Colossians chapter, ch- chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Like this. I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation because it just reads real simple. It says, You were dead because of your sins, And because of your sinful nature, it was not cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for He forgave all of your sins, canceled the record of charges against us, and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In the New King James, it says He's taken the handwriting of requirements, which which were against us, which were contrary to us. We could not keep them. And He nailed them to His cross. The old covenant was glorious, but it faded as you found yourself unworthy of it. You couldn't get rid of your sin by the old covenant. It didn't, it didn't draw you any closer by keeping it. And yet by breaking it, it pushed you farther away. And Moses, in the presence of God, came off the mountain, having been given these ten commandments written on stone, and it was so glorious, the, the presence of God and the finger of God writing His Ten Commandments on the stone that Moses came down the mountain and his face was glowing. It was like, ah. And Moses didn't even know it. That's the interesting thing. In, in um, verse 8, it says, well, I hate this thing. I'm sorry. I got this new, Sean made me do it. Verse 8. It says, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? So Moses comes down, his face is shining, but that shining, it tells us, was fading away. And now it says, for the ministry of the Spirit is more glorious, verse 9, for if the ministry of the of condemnation, interesting how it calls it that, it's the ministry of death, it's the ministry that condemns, had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. And we talked about this last time. We're go- when we're born again of the Spirit, when we put our trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, something interesting happens. Now, the way that the writer of Hebrews describes it there in chapter 10, verse 14, it says that by one offering, meaning the, the offering of the body of Jesus, the blood of Jesus being offered for us, by one offering, He has, past tense, perfected forever, past tense, and that goes on forever, and then... He has perfected forever those who are being or those who He is sanctifying. Present continual. And it's, that's an interesting thought. So when, when God saves you by that offering, you are perfected forever, but He is still, the word sanctified means holy, He is still during that time making you holy. You're, you're going through a process of being made holy. It's not something that happens like the perfection God sees you as perfect. But then he quotes the Old Testament to prove that. He says, for it is written that, um, what did he say? Oh yeah, I will write my law, (laughs) it's written, I will write my law upon their hearts and on their minds and I shall be their God and they shall be my people. 
And so through that sanctifying process, he writes his commandments, his law, his desire for us on our hearts and on our minds, no longer on tablets of stone, but he puts it within us is what he's saying. And as we have that in our hearts and our minds, we begin to desire to do different things. But then he adds to it. And here's the perfect part. Their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. He has, he has cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. He's chosen to not remember our sins and lawless deeds anymore. All because we put our trust in Jesus Christ. As I mentioned in the beginning, it's like being married rather than being engaged. It's the difference between the two. Or, or as I've said before, is that my microphone making that noise? That's something outside. Oh, they're shoveling. Okay, I was like, I thought that was me. <laughs> I was like, Joe, help. Um, as I've said before, and I think that this is a great illustration, getting say, being a Christian is more like opening presents than it is like doing chores. Do you understand that? It is receiving what God has for us and the grace that God puts in us to be able to do the impossible by grace. And that's the work of God rather than trying to be good enough to merit salvation or goodness, which is impossible. That's a ministry of death. And so verse 10, he says, for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. What this means is you couldn't compare the two. You, you can't say, oh, you know, the law's good and, and oh, well, the new covenant's good too. It's like, it's like, Comparing a candle to the sun, right? Now, it's, it's good. I remember um, Friday morning, my kids got up around 6 o'clock. They went downstairs, and as kids tend to do, they turned on every single light in the entire living room. And, it, and we have two lights in the ceiling over there, two, one light in the ceiling over here, different switches. We have two lamps and then another lamp on the other side. All the lights were on. And it was nice and bright that morning, you know, downstairs. And, and I didn't come downstairs till a little bit later. And I, I just remember, you know, I, I think I walked past the living room and went into the kitchen and then the day kind of progressed and I was doing things and I had to leave and come take a kid to the doctor's appointment and come back and take another kid to the doctor's appointment and come back. Three in the afternoon, I walk into the living room and I sit down on the couch and I open a, a book to start to read. And, and then I, I noticed, oh, all the lights in this room are on. Now, as a conscientious father, I'm flipping those lights off. Who turned the lights? Who left the lights on? You know, whatever. Because I want to save money. But when I shut the lights off, the brightness didn't change. It, the sun was coming, the south-facing windows, giant picture windows. The sun was shining in those windows, and it did not change the brightness because those lights were on. So, too, when you come to the law and you see the law, you're like... Bing, a light goes on. You're, you're like, yes, this is great. This is good. Look how obvious it is. This is how everybody should live. But then that begins to fade when the sun rises. And when you come to the sun, there's no, 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 no more need for this light because the sun eclipses that. I give these books out every once in a while. and I, I'm not opposed to marriage books. I, 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 I like some of them. I, I think that some of them are good. And you know, some of you have done the five love languages. Um, I've passed out those books. I've passed out the ones I really like that I think probably are, are the most um, eye-opening are the ones by Shanti Feldman, For Him Only and For Her Only. And, and basically, as you read these books, you're just like... I, I remember actually... Honestly, my, my wife and I were driving, and she's reading, and she's like, you're not like this. And, and I was like, what? And she said, well, it says here that men don't like to ask for directions because, um, you know, they, they want to feel like they, they can do it. And she's like, you asked for directions. And I said, yeah, I'll ask for directions. But actually, we were on the way somewhere, and I was thinking to myself, I don't know where we're going, but I've been there once before. I think I can figure it out. When I have five minutes left, that's when I'll ask for directions. Because I wanted to figure it out before I just popped to asking directions, right? And I said, that's exactly how I was thinking. I mean, at the moment she read that, she's like, you're not like this. I'm like, exactly like that. But these books, they, they kind of 
illuminate. You know, they interviewed over a thousand people to, to ask them, you know, what do you think about these situations? And women revealed their hearts, men revealed their hearts. I always give um, a book to the woman, you know, for women only, about men. And, and because I know men, I never give a book to a man. I give them the audio. I, <laughs> here's some CDs, listen to these. Because most men won't read, some will, but most won't. I always ask them, you know. And I always tell them, I didn't at first, but I learned to. I, I tell them, and whenever I hand out a marriage book, I always tell them, now you're going to read this and you're going to think it's helping you, but it's not. Don't, don't think that you're going to be helped by this book, that your marriage is going to be fixed by this book, is what I mean by that. Because it will not fix your marriage. Five love languages won't fix your marriage. For him only, for her only, which I think is even better than that, won't fix your marriage. What fixes your marriage? That is only the work of God. Only God himself, by his spirit, working through your spirit, and and putting down your pride, and making him Lord, that is the only thing that can fix your marriage. Because you could be mistaken when you read that book, and I've had people tell me this, that helped me so much, man, you saved my marriage by giving me that book. Wrong. And then I watched that guy continue to make the same mistakes. Even though he understood his wife better, he, you know, it, it didn't overcome his sin nature, right? It's the Spirit of God that does that work. And until we're willing to submit to the Spirit of God, nothing is going to change in our lives. And, and that's, that's true for when it comes to what God would require of us. It's, it's true for marriage. It's true for anything. Verse 12, it says, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. And, and we do. We have. We have hope like nothing else, guys. I mean, think about the message that we have. It's not a message of, well, now that you're a Christian, you can't dress that way. Uh, it might, I mean, let the Lord work on that. But for the most part, you know, we can dress just like we're dressed. We don't have to put on some strange outfit, some black suit and, and, a, and a square hat or something like that. We don't have to change what we eat. Now, now I, I know that there's been people who have sold you a gospel, and gospel means good news, but what they were telling you is bad news because it sounded exciting at first. Well, we, we in our group, we, we live very righteously. And, and you're like, oh, I hunger for righteousness. Yes, I, I want that. What? And, and then they say, so you've got to stop drinking coffee. What? <laughs> Are you kidding me? You know? You, you can't dress... You have to dress like this. You have to put these types of clothes on. You, you can't um, eat meat on certain days of the week. Or you have to keep the law of Moses. And, and then all of these, and you, have, you only can worship on this day, and all these rules start getting piled on, and we're just like, ah, you know, I thought this was good news. It's not good news. Because even though it's a, it's a Jewish law or it's a man-made law, it, it doesn't matter. It, it's impossible for us to live up to it. And even if we did live up to it, it wouldn't bring us any closer to God just by keeping the rules. That's the problem with these rules, these lists that we make for ourselves is we think, oh, I'm doing these things. Look how good I am. But God's standard is so much higher than that. And so what shall I do? Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? As Paul says, I thank Jesus Christ who has lifted the burden of sin, who has forgiven me. Aren't you glad you have good news? Jesus died for all your sins and you can be forgiven for all sin and reconciled to God simply by putting your trust in Him, in His finished work, that He died upon the cross to save you from your sins and that He rose from the grave and by putting my trust in Him, I can be forgiven, I can be saved. Sometimes it's necessary though. You know, I mean, we have this good news. We, we have we're boldness in proclaiming it because it's so easy to say, hey, Jesus died for your sins, man. You don't have to carry that burden. But sometimes you'll come across an individual who says, well, I'm a good person. I'm not a sinner. That offends me that you would say I'm a sinner. Now, what do you do with that person? Oh, good. Well, uh... no, you give them the law. You give them the bad news. That is the bad news. Well, have you kept the Ten Commandments? They always say the same thing. Well, sure. I haven't murdered anybody. As if that's the Ten Commandments. Oh, really? Have you ever told a lie? And you start to you pile. If they say, if they say, oh, I know I'm a sinner. I need, I need forgiveness. Then you just give them the gospel. But if they say, oh, I'm, I'm a good person, then you give them the law. And you, you let them compare themselves to the law. And as they find themselves guilty, 
then hopefully they'll be ready for repentance and you can give them the good news that Jesus died for their sins. Verse 13, it says, Unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Paul, Paul gives us some insight into Moses. This is interesting. In Exodus chapter 34, Verse 29, it tells us the story. It says, Now it was so when Moses came down from the mountain of Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain. Moses did not know that the skin of his face had shone while he talked with him, Aaron. And so Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses. Behold, oh, excuse me, talked with God. Excuse me, he talked with him, God. So that Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses. Behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. So Moses called to, to, to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterwards, the children of Israel came near, and he gave them the commandment of all, all that the Lord had spoken on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Now, I'm sure that when Moses f- first put the veil over his face, he did it because it hurt their eyes to look at him. Man, they looked at him, and like, they're like, I can't even stare at you, and it is scary. I don't want to make anybody frightened. So he put a veil over his face to to block that light coming off of his face. But Paul gives us insight into Moses. Moses noticed probably that that the, the shininess was fading away. And rather than take it up and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm easy to look at now. He kept the veil up so that they couldn't see that the glory was fading. Isn't that interesting? And so too in the law, that people think, oh, the law is good, it, it, it's, it's all we need. It hurts our eyes when we look at it, but it's okay. It's okay. Verse 14, he says, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, A veil lies in their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. If you talk to somebody who's in a cult, who lives by a system of rules to keep for righteousness, or if you talk to a Jew, they'll tell you how good their religion is and how they do all these good things, and as if that's what makes a religion good, is all the works that they do and all the commandments that they're supposed to keep, as if anybody could ever keep them. I mean, in a sense, they're lying to you by telling you it's good when they themselves haven't kept the, the rules. And, and, and they, they, they'll, they'll tell you that, but then, and maybe you've experienced this, when somebody gets saved out of that, and they see Jesus for His forgiveness and His grace, the veil is taken away, and they are like, "Woo! this is awesome! Jesus is so good. It's amazing to me how, how, depending on how deep somebody is into a religion or how deep they are into sin, when that veil is removed, how much glorious it is, right? I mean, if they were like hardcore Jew, hardcore into the law, hardcore LDS, whatever it was that they were doing to try to keep all the rules, when they're set free from that, they are on fire. It's exciting. I remember... Um, I, we told this story on Thursday night, if you weren't here, um, basically just to, sh- about Shannon's conversion and how she got saved. But, it, you know, she was LDS growing up. She was LDS. And I saw her in Denny's, and I was going to get out of there before she saw me because I, didn't, I liked her, and I didn't want to, you know, put myself in a temptation situation. Good advice for any boy who's in love with a girl who's not a Christian. Um, run away. Or, plan B, her, her cousin saw me. And said, hey, Mike. And I was busted. And so I thought to myself, good. I'll go over there. I'll share the gospel with her. And either she'll get saved or she'll hate me. Both good outcomes, you know, in my mind. You know? And so I went over there and I, I started talking to her. And we started talking about the Lord. And talking about being saved. And I, I, I asked her, you know, knowing that she was LDS and that that's a works-based system of being worthy. It's all about worthiness. I said, have you kept the Ten Commandments? And she said, oh yeah, pretty much. I mean, I've never killed anyone. And I said, oh, okay, well, um, you know, let's do a test. Let's see how well you've done. And I went through every single one of them, from number one to number ten, and showed her, by God's law, or by what Jesus had said, 
that she'd broken every single one of them. And she was like, oh. And then I talked about the sacrificial system and how the Jews, because they knew they'd broken them, they'd bring the lambs and sacrifice them, and that it was just this continual thing. But then Jesus came once and for all, the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And I began to explain to her. And she was just like, I get it. I mean, just like right there in Denny. She's like, I get it. It finally makes sense. And she's trying to explain it to her cousin Danny, who's hearing all this for the first time. And Shannon had had a few friends working on her for a while. And so she was kind of in a place to receive it, but her cousin Danny was like, what? No, you know, the veil was not taken away. But when when it was for Shannon, when it was lifted, she was like, yes, I can be saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross and the veil in the temple was torn when he did. You know, it was very symbolic. Inside the temple of God, there was this Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were three items the tablets of stone where God had written his law, the jar of manna, which was God providing for the children of Israel, and and Aaron's rod, which represented the authority that God had put over the the children of Israel. And, And on top of that was the mercy seat, and on the mercy seat were these two golden cherubim that were looking over the mercy seat. And on the day of Yom Kippur, once a year, only once a year, the high priest would take the blood of a bull and he would go behind the veil, the only time that anybody could ever go behind that veil. And and the Shekinah glory, the, the physical manifestation of light of God would come into that place and it would rest above the mercy seat. And and as God would look down into the Ark of the Covenant, he would see his Ten Commandments and he'd look at his people and he would see that they had broken them and his, his wrath would be kindled. And then he would look down and he'd see the jar of manna, his provision for the people, and he would see that the people rejected his provision. And his anger would be kindled. And then he would look down upon the, the rod of Aaron and, and his leadership over the people. And he'd see that the people were rebelling against the leadership of the people and his wrath would be kindled. But then the, the priest would take the blood of the bull first for himself and he'd sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And then he'd go out. And he probably did that quick because he didn't want to die in the presence of God. He'd go out quickly and get the, the blood of the goat. And they had two goats that they would they would bring in, they would sacrifice one and put its blood on the other goat and then send it out of the camp. They'd, it'd go way out in the wilderness. In other words, the sin is being pushed away. It's, they're forgetting the sin is kind of the idea. It, it goes along with our sins and lawless deeds he remembers no more. They would, they would send it out, way out into the wilderness to never be seen again. But the other goat, they would put the blood in a basin and he'd go into the mercy seat and he'd sprinkle that upon the mercy seat. And, and so when God would look down, all he would see was a spotless blood that covered the sins of the people once again for another year. When Jesus died upon the cross, when he said, it is finished, it tells us that the veil in the temple was torn. Now, we know from history, the historians tell us that this veil was three stories tall. And, and in Herod's temple, it was much thicker in the old in, in Solomon's temple, but in Herod's temple, that veil was 10 inches thick fabric. It was a heavy veil. And, and that veil, three stories tall, 10 inches thick, ripped from top to bottom. It, 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 people say if, that, if, a, if a fabric that thick would rip like that, the priests who would have been in the temple at that time it would have broke their eardrums. It would have been so loud. And, and it was symbolic of the fact that God has removed the veil and the access through Jesus Christ was now available directly to Him. We can access Him through the blood of Jesus Christ. Anyone who comes to Him, the veil is removed. Verse 17, it says, Now the Lord is a Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's beautiful. It's, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. First, Paul says, The Lord is a spirit. And so he's saying that the Holy Spirit, along with the Father and the Son, is God. He is the one that God uses as he indwells us to write his law upon our hearts and our minds and set us free from the demands of the Ten Commandments, the law, the things that would condemn us. He has covered it by 
his blood and he has put himself inside of us so that we might begin to live differently. Second, God does not bring us into bondage as it is written in the law, but he sets us free. Free from sin, free from the results of sin, free from the penalty of the law, and free to know God. The, the transformation begins to move us away from sin. So when you hear where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He's not saying liberty to sin, because if you've ever sinned, you know that sin is not freedom, it's bondage, isn't it? It's like, oh, I'm free to, to do heroin. <laughs> Pretty soon you're not free to do heroin, you have to do heroin, right? Same with sin, any sin. When you start to allow yourself sin to creep into your life, you become in bondage to it and you can't escape it. He sets you free from sin. What do you mean he sets us free from sin? You realize as a Christian, you are not bound to sin anymore. Now, a lot of Christians believe that they are. The jail cell has been opened. You've been told to go out. But oftentimes you feel like you're stuck. It's like the elephant, you know, when it's a baby elephant, they take a, an elephant, they put a chain around its leg, they take a long stake, they drive it into the ground. And, and that elephant, that baby elephant, will pull against that stake and pull against that stake until his little leg is just bloody and, and it can't escape. But then as that elephant grows, chains are heavy and long stakes are hard to pound to the ground, so they get a smaller stake and a, a heavy rope. And they tie that rope around the leg of the elephant, and then they put a much smaller stake, they, they pound that into the ground. And that giant elephant that could pull a tree out of the ground won't even try to get away from that stake. Why? Because it remembers the pain of it. It remembers how bloody its leg got that first time when it was just a little guy. And now that it feels that, the weight of that on its leg, it won't even pull against that rope. Even though he could just go, bing, and walk away. So too, sin has the same hold on you. You think you're bound, but Jesus has set you free. Oh, you don't understand, Pastor Mike. You don't understand the power of the temptation, the, the overwhelming rush of, of, of sin that comes upon me, and I just can't help it. Oh, I understand. And I also know why. But you want me to tell you how to be free from that? It's very simple. Actually, they wrote it in a song, so I'll sing it to you. Just kidding. I won't sing. It's not my gift. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The way to set yourself free from sin is to draw near to Jesus. And with proximity to Jesus, sin and the temptation that's been overwhelming you fades and fades and fades and in the light of his glory and his love and and in his presence his fullness of joy the 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 promise of of pleasure for a season over here just kind of becomes irrelevant to you as a christian and yet if you focus on sin okay i'm not going to do it i'm not going to do it i'm not going to do it. okay i'll do it next i'm not going to do it next time you know that's what happens to us we get overwhelmed by it and so we just give into it because we're focusing on it Focus your eyes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Fall in love with Him. Delight yourself in Him. And He gives you the desires of your heart. He changes all that. He, he sets you free from the power of sin and death. You are no longer bound by those things. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect this side of glory. You probably never will be. You're still going to, make, you're still going to have thoughts. But, and, and those will lead to sin. But the problem is, um, you know, you're still flesh. Someday you'll be perfect. But you are, as we're going to see next, you are getting better. Notice this, verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, there's nothing keeping us away from God. There's nothing between us and Him anymore. With unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. You know, and, and oftentimes the Word of God is described as a mirror. You know, it, it exposes us, but it also exposes now to us Jesus the glory of the Lord and are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus removes the veil. He's accepted you as his bride, accepted you in the beloved. He has reconciled you to the Father. He has done the work. And now your job, your marching orders 
to move forward, to take it, is this. To rest in Him. To rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ that He has done it all. And allow the Spirit of God to begin to transform you by the renewing of your mind. By the transforming of your heart as He writes His law upon your heart and your mind. And as you draw near to Him, He will draw near to you and your life will be, will be new. You being transformed into the same image, same image of Christ from glory to greater glory. And that's what the Spirit of God does in you. And, and I hope that that's a reality for all of us. You look at your life from the day you got saved until now, and even if that was just a week ago, it doesn't matter how long ago it was, you should be able to see there is a difference since a week ago than I got, when I got saved, or since two years ago, or since three years ago, or since ten years ago, or since fifty years ago when I got saved. I am a different person now than I was then, or that I would have been if I would have stayed on that path. Jesus is changing me. Now, hopefully that's a radical difference. Some it is. Some it's not quite so radical. But yet it's real. And it's there. You're being changed. A little bit at a time. I, I know some people who have been absolutely radically changed. You know, in, in a moment. You know, I, think of, I can think of several of you, but I won't point you out. I'll point out somebody who's probably watching on Facebook. I remember my, my stepdad, he, he was that guy who was just always, you know, into drugs, into alcohol, into whatever, you know, living life for the party. Last person hated Jesus, blaspheme all the time. Never thought in, in my wildest dreams that he, he was kind of one of those people I, I doubt he would ever get saved. That was always my thought. And then, he came to church here one day, Worship wasn't even over, and he had surrendered his life to the Lord. He, he was radically born again. And he went back home to Pocatello, where he was living at the time. And I'd been talking to him on the phone, back and forth, answering questions for him. But you could tell there was something different. And, and Shannon and I, like three weeks, I don't remember how long it was, but some time went by, and we went back to Pocatello, and we were going to go to church with them, which was very exciting. And so we're in church with them. And um, he's there, and he doesn't look any different. You know, he still has, he still looks the same as he always did. You know, so the the outward is the same. It looks the same. You know, the long hair and the hey, you know, and just mannerisms and stuff. But he's at church, which was weird enough. And then afterwards, we went to Perkins. And we're sitting there at Perkins, and the waitress comes up, and he looks her in the eyes with a glow in his eyes, and he says, do you know Jesus Christ? Have you put your trust in him for salvation? And I'm looking at him and I'm like, <sighs> like, <laughs> like I, I can't even understand what's happening, what I'm seeing. This is the most bizarre thing I've ever experienced in my life. It was like, I can't put these two things together. And, and since, you know, he's cut his hair a little bit more and he's, he's cleaned up a lot. I mean, the Lord just cleaned him up quite a bit more. But when I look at him, I, I don't even, it's like a, it, it's like a guy I met a few years back. It's not like the guy I grew up with at all. I can't even picture that. I can't even put those two contexts together in my mind. They don't make any sense to me because he was born again and radically changed. And some people, you know what? I think probably he who sins much is forgiven much, who loves much. That person is going to change a little bit faster, more radically than other people. You know, maybe you were a good person. You're self-righteous and you always lived a pretty clean life and now you're saved and, you know, people don't see it as much in your life, but it's there. It's there you're being changed from glory to greater glory because of what Jesus did. Not because you're keeping the rules. Not because the law has had its effect on you. Because the only thing the law brings is death. But Jesus brings life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your law. That it, it does its work. It's so beautiful, so glorious, Lord. And yet, it's no, not helpful to us, Lord. It shows us our lack. It shows us our, our depravity, our poverty of spirit, which drives us to you, Jesus. 
So help us not to go backward, back into those things, law keeping and rule keeping and trying to establish our righteousness through those things, Lord, but to to keep our eyes on you, Jesus, to put our faith in you alone and to, to entrust you with our salvation, with our life, and just as we don't see as ourselves being sufficient in anything, Lord, that we would trust you for all all the work that's going to be done through us, Lord. That we would find ourselves resting in the sufficiency and the fullness of you. And as we take communion this morning, Lord, give us a fresh revelation, a fresh understanding of what, what it means, Lord, that this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That we might be illuminated just a little bit more about what it means that you gave your body for us, Lord. And and, and when you say, this this cup is a new covenant in my blood, open our hearts and our minds to understand just a little bit more what the implications of that blood are upon our lives. What what it has done in our lives. Lord, I know that we're going to be learning of these things for all eternity. But enlighten us to this morning. Help us to trust you just a little bit more. Help us to walk just a little bit closer to you, Jesus. That we might have all that you have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray.